everybody, welcome back to Pagan's Witchy Corner. My name is Pagan, and I am joined by the amazing author, Stephanie Woodfield. She is the author of so many great books, including Dedicant Devotee and Priest, and Priestess of the Morgan, and so many others. So if you have not checked out her books, you should go do that. There's going to be links in the description, as always. So please go check out those books, because I promise you, after today's interview, you're going to want several copies. I promise. <laughs> so, uh, Stephanie, welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you. Hi, thank you for having me. I am so glad that we get to talk. Uh, for those who have been following the show, and especially if you keep up with my updates, you probably thought that this interview was going to hit a little earlier. It was supposed to. We had some technical difficulties during Mercury's retrograde, and it decided to not record part of the audio, and then part of the file was corrupted. It was just a mess. But now we're back, and we're doing it all over again, and it's going to be awesome because we have new stuff to talk about since last time, so I'm excited. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started talking about your books. You wrote two really great books last year, and I believe that one of them came, I think they both came out last year. I don't have the dates in front of me. Um, but yeah, they were absolutely incredible books. That was The Priestess of the Morgan and Dedicant Devotee and Priest. Uh, let's talk a little bit about why you wrote The Priestess of the Morgan for starters. Well, for that book, I felt there was a lot more to still say about the Morgan. My first book about her Celtic lore and spellcraft of the Dark Goddess was actually my first book. So that's going on over 10 years ago. And my devotion has evolved and deepened. And my, I guess you could say adventures <laughs> with mm -hmm. the Morgan have uh, continued on. So I felt there was a lot more to say um, about her if you have a devotional practice to her, not just this an introduction, who she is and how you can try to connect with her, but what is it really like to work with her? And part of my inspiration was Sybil Leake's A Diary of a Witch, mm -hmm. because for me, that was the first book where it wasn't like a how-to, it was more about her life as a practicing witch. And I'd never really seen that side of a witchcraft practice. So I kind of wanted to do that for the Morgan, plus add some additional rituals and different ways you could connect with her. So it's kind of a, an amalgam of all those, <laughs> those things combined. <laughs> well, it was a beautifully well done job of that. And as somebody who works with the Morgan, I can tell you that as I was reading it, I was like, oh my God, other people have these experiences with her, not just me. <laughs> and it was kind of one of those um, kind of affirming things for me because there were moments in it where I was like, the same thing has happened to me, like literally almost verbatim. So, wow, this is cool that I get to read it in somebody else's book. And so hopefully if you work with the Morgan and you read this book, you're going to have similar experiences to that, seeing that apparently she's just a little rough with everybody sometimes. Just a little <laughs> the bit. Best you know, ways. Fully two by four. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the cool things that I loved about your book is the way that you obviously do your storytelling through it and talk about all of your experiences, but they're so immersive. Like you, you, when you're reading it, you do such a beautiful job of making us feel like we're standing there with you experiencing the same thing which is so amazing. Not many authors can do that, but you did it beautifully. So thank you for doing that because it was amazing. Oh, thank you. Well, I always think that um, any story that I share, it's more of something that can help the reader to mm -hmm. kind of see a window into what it's like. So you can, I basically learn from my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really great way to put it. And you do such a great job with working uh, the priestess in the Morgan, and it really does show a really great example of what it's like to be one of her priestesses or priestesses or priests, whichever you prefer, whichever title you prefer. Uh, we are all inclusive here, so we enjoy that. But you did such a great job. And then kind of bridging a little bit towards uh, your other book, Dedicant Priest, uh, Dedicant Devotee and Priest, and that one it was a lot more in depth in my opinion of you kind of breaking down the individualistic roles with our own deity worship so let's talk a little bit about that it 
tell me your experiences with that and why you decided to write it and all the fun times you had writing it. I'm sure you had many. Well, Dadakan Devotee Priest really came out of this idea uh, that we don't have a manual for doing devotional work. Mm -hmm. And when I'm traveling, when I'm doing workshops, whether it's in person or online, that's usually what my workshops are focused on. And that's usually what I'm asked about the most because we kind of get this um, vague idea and a lot of other resources that, okay, you create an altar, you put the statues on there, you light the incense and bam, somehow like this telephone line <laughs> between you and the gods is just suddenly and concretely formed and that's it. <laughs> and there's nothing else to know. And that's um, very far from the truth. So I wanted a guide that really talked about what kind of dedications you can have to deity because not everyone's going to be priest. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is going to have oaths or commitments to a deity. Um, it might just be a deity that you feel very called to honor and worship and have a connection with, and that's okay too. And well, that's another thing too. We kind of feel that we have to get all the merit badges, if you will, <laughs> yes. that we all have to achieve the merit bad of, badge of priest or priestess. Um, and it doesn't work that way. So I wanted people to kind of have a guide that I didn't have when I started this to mm -hmm. kind of help them through that process and figure out where they fall with their devotions and how they can go about connecting to any deity. Yes, that is absolutely a really great way to put it too, because a lot of times we are kind of led, especially as newer witches, when you first join the craft, all of the books are talking about, you know, here's the different ways that you could do this. You could eventually become a priest and all this, but there's never really been a roadmap per se. And it does make it sound like we are supposed to get the merit badges and we're supposed to go all the way to the top. And then it's like, okay, well you get there. Now what? Now what do you do with your life? And I don't think that any sort of witchcraft or any sort of deity work is supposed to be just a let's get to the top of the mountain and call it a day then right. it's supposed to be a continual journey and a lot of times there's a lot of books out there that do mislead that and make it seem like oh you have to get to the top and then you're done congratulations you made it to the top now you can just go do something else i guess with your time instead <laughs> <laughs> which is not right and then you you move on <laughs> yes yes we we don't want to just get the certificates we want to have that continually working relationship and talk a little bit to us about what it is like to be a priestess of pretty much any deity and obviously you're a priestess of the morgan but what is it kind of like in your day-to-day -day life for that well, I think when you're a priest of any deity, service is always going to be the biggest aspect of your devotion. And, you know, you do get things out of this connection to deity as well, because you have a deeper connection with them. But when you're a dedicant, when you're just honoring a deity, it's more about you and the deity. Mm -hmm. It's not about the outside world or the outside community. So while other devotions are more focused on your own personal work, priest kind of takes that um, a notch up where you have that devotional work between you and the deity and your own personal practice. But then there's the aspect of service in the greater community. And that can, community can be a lot of different things to different people. Yes. But you are in service to that deity and it's not really just about you anymore. That makes absolutely perfect sense. And I would also take it, um, my question, I guess, follow-up question to uh, ask that is, can we have priestesses or priestess, priests in witchcraft that are almost non-denominational, meaning like we don't have a specific tie to a deity, but we are more of, I guess teacher is more of the appropriate term versus priest or priestess. What are your thoughts on that? You can have that. I mean, everyone sees the divine differently. Mm -hmm. So I could see that in the sense of you're in service to the community and the goddess and the God without a specific name to them. Um, priest is always going to have some connection to the divine, mm -hmm. but that's also something else I talk about in the book. You kind of have to, when you do this work, stop and think about what you think a deity is. Yes. 
um, you know, everyone's idea is different. <laughs> in most of the religions that were brought, we were brought up in, mm -hmm. you feel that deity is omnipresent, they're ever present, they're omnipotent, all powerful, and they have all the knowledge in the universe. Well, that isn't necessarily how pagan gods are. I mean, you could see them in that sense, but, you know, they're not necessarily all powerful. They have a very specific range of powers and skills. Mm -hmm. um, some people might see them simply as aspects. Others, like myself, see them as very real beings. So our view on deity changes. And actually also in the book, I talked about how you could use some of these techniques with talking to other spirits as well. Because again, our definition of God can be very loose. Yes. So it could also involve ancestor worship or working with the she, the fair folk. Um, what people see as deity varies in different cultures. And, you know, you kind of have to leave it open to interpretation. So as far as being a priest or priestess, your view of what a deity is, is definitely going to color how you are going to do your work. Yes. And that's okay. I think that's absolutely a beautiful way to put that. And I think that that really does encompass what I was trying to ask beforehand. So thank you for that. Now, you got to do a really fun experience this last uh, last weekend, I believe, or maybe it was a weekend before, but you got to go to a really fun retreat. Do you want to talk about that? What did you experience? What was it about? And uh, what kind of retreat was it? Well, it was the Morgan's Call Retreat, which is an event that I started and organized. And it was our ninth year, which was pretty amazing. Um, we survived COVID <laughs> to be in person again, which was also amazing. Um, it was it was really special on a lot of different levels. Um, we had that kind of awkward um, getting to re-know everyone again thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like you've just been a little Zoom square on my screen for like almost three years. Like, oh, wow, you're a person that are, is in the same physical space as me. So that was really cool. Um, as I probably told everyone a few times, because I am really tall, I'm like almost six feet tall. I forgot how short everyone else was <laughs> and that I had to like bend down to hug them. I'm like, oh, I guess I am really a giant. But, oh. <laughs> um, but it was really cool to see everyone in person again and um, just do ritual in person again was amazing too. That was, um, yeah, that was another thing we kind of had to readjust to. Um, and the really cool thing was doing the retreat. Well, the first time I did the retreat afterwards, it was a really amazing experience. And I wasn't really sure if it was something that was con going to continue on. Mm -hmm. And after that first year, I offered the Morgan a certain amount of time that I would continue to do the event if she wanted it to continue. And for me to do this, I really did not maybe consider how long nine years was when I said it, but I said it, so I had to do it. And what was really cool is this year marked that ninth year. So I got to hand over the event to Karen, who's our operations manager, who's really been, you know, working behind the scenes since the mm -hmm. beginning um, to, for her to continue it on. So it was really cool to see that and see how this community grows. So lots of cool things. That is absolutely amazing. And, you know, it, definitely with COVID, COVID changed a lot of our magical spaces in a lot of ways. Um, you know, with our group, we do everything virtually because most of our people are spread out across the U.S. and the globe. We have a few people from Australia and Germany, uh, a couple from Russia and the Ukraine and several other people. But we have so many other amazing individuals that, you know, physical spaces are very hard for a lot of people to get to. And most of our community is um, either disabled or chronically ill in some way, shape or form. So the cool thing about COVID is it did give us all the really great time to be like, oh, we can do these virtually. This is neat. We didn't realize you could do magic over the internet over Zoom. Now we right. know. <laughs> but it does take away a little bit of that almost energetic connection of being in the same space with other humans. 
And right. it's very difficult to kind of recreate that sometimes over the internet. But I do have to say that, you know, it's been a really eye-opening experience in a lot of ways, but I bet it was probably really profound having so many individuals come back to a space and getting to work in person again and getting to feel that energy again. And, oh man, I it, it's almost, you know, when you get to have one of those really good ritual experiences, it's almost a little bit like a drug. It feels really good when you're done. You're like, wow, yeah. I forgot what that Look was that like. <laughs> It is that ritual high, and it's so much fun. Uh, but yeah, so your event that you've been doing it, so you're not going to do it anymore. You're you're handing over the reins. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm still going to be there and part of the organizational part of it, but I get to let Karen handle the the big things, which yep. is nice. I bet that but is nice. Yeah, and I think that's something that um, we don't really see that often in the community too. That we can hand things off you know, to the next generation and, you know, help them grow as leaders. And mm -hmm. I think that's really important because a lot of things, you know, a lot of events or groups die out once the, um, the leader is, you know, burnt out or tired or can't do it anymore. Yeah, I would say that's very true. And, you know, that's a lot of things that we will see with some groups too, where a lot of the elder members don't really feel comfortable handing off the reins because they're like, no, this has been mine forever. And so <laughs> I think that at the same time, if we kind of got in that mindset of saying, yes, it was mine, but I'm not always going to be here. So what's going right. to happen to this group if I don't hand it off to people? And yeah, your group may not survive when you hand it off to the person. That That is a reality that sometimes does happen. But the cool thing is, if you help people and people, you find people that are just as passionate about it you are, then you're going to do really great things by handing it off because it's basically new eyes on an old project. So that's a really exciting thing. I'm excited to hear all about the uh, what's going to happen in the future with it. I think it's going to be fun ha uh, seeing how it changes from your hands to uh, your, I guess, new predecessor's hands. <laughs> <laughs> I think she'll do a good job. She's always been behind the scenes helping with things. And, um, you know, it's a chance for her to shine and for her to kind of guide them. So I'll be happy to just do ritual and do temple staff and, um, yeah, <laughs> relax a little bit. Yep. I'm sure the Morgan's going to find more <laughs> things for me to do. Oh, I'm sure she will. She is very good about that. She She is mm -hmm. very good about, you know, sometimes I've noticed with her, she'll take a seat back and be like, no. We're just gonna sit on this one and not do anything and then a couple of years goes by and then she's like hey by the way i'm still here and we're gonna do this thing now right now <laughs> it's like but i have other plans no you don't i canceled those <laughs> yep yeah that's exactly it <laughs> and sure enough you will find that uh she, when she does the whole i canceled your plans whatever plans you've had will immediately fall through and it's like yeah what how did this break? How did this fall apart? And it's like, this was all set in stone. And then she's like, <laughs> that's cute that you thought it was set in stone. <laughs> the Morgan gets what she wants. <laughs> she does get what she wants. And she is an incredible uh, deity to work with. Um, can we talk a little bit about, I know that there is a lot of fear associated with the Morgan. And you talk about this in your books as well, especially in the Priestess of the Morgan, where a lot of people are afraid to work with her. So can we talk a little bit about that and why people shouldn't necessarily be afraid to work with her? Well, I think fear is going to start off with the idea of a female deity that is connected with war. So she's connected to something scary, something we don't like, and she's aggressive, um, as you seem to have <laughs> figured out yep. as well. Yeah, yeah, she she can... I, I don't like using the term aggressive, but she is assertive. <laughs> Definitely assertive, assertive. yeah, that would work too. <laughs> and that's something that we don't always feel comfortable with um, in a female. So she's connected to things that are kind of scary and she forces us to look at things that we need to change, things that we probably want to not look at. So of course she's gonna be scary. She's gonna be frightening. And I think that the, she does approach people and ask nicely, if you will, first. And we usually ignore those. 
So when the Morgan tries to get your attention, it's pretty intense. Yes. And that's, I think, where the fear comes in. Because after you actually listen to her, after you actually do the work and you're open to it and you're not running away from it, she isn't like that all the time. That is very, very true. I I remember when I first started working with the Morgan, even years before, I had been told by elder practitioners, it's like, you, know, you might want to be wary about working with her, you know, only strong people can work with her, you know, all the, the, the rumors of working with her, most of those people didn't work with her, obviously. Um, but, you know, the, the fun thing about her when she came to me, she scared the living crap out of me. <laughs> and then it, that. she does that, but she, it, she's very intense. And she is one of those deities that when she came to me, she scared the crap out of me. She took me through... Um, I've had other wonderful elder practitioners tell me that she's like, she took you through an initiation and I'm like, oh, so that's what that was. It scared the hell out of me. Uh, but it really was an incredible experience. It's probably one of the most profound deity experiences I've ever had. And I will never forget it, despite how terrifying I, how terrified I was in the moment with her. But once I got through it, she's just like, okay, well, now we get to do the work because you survived that congratulations let's go party and have a good time and you get to do all the work now don't get me wrong working with her is still challenging but she is an incredibly moving deity she will move literal mountains in your life in ways that you would never expect and she will bring things into your life that you're just like wow and you get done and you're just like i can't believe that i went from here to there and you know a year to two years and she will make you a better witch, in my opinion. She is an incredible deity to work with. Uh, not to say that there's not other deities out there that are equally as powerful. There are. But my experiences with her have topped all the rest, for sure. <laughs> she She's a wonderful deity to work with. Uh, but yeah, she is definitely one that I have found that is very intense when she comes to you and a little frightening. So... I would say that what are your thoughts on somebody who wants to basically go from being a dedicant to being a priest? What would those steps be for somebody? Obviously, that's going to be individualistic in some regards, but kind of talking a little bit about that um, just briefly, what would those steps be for somebody who wants to do something like that? Well, you really have to look at a couple of things. Um, first is your connection to deity. Is this something that you want uh, or the deity wants? Because sometimes, you know, if the deity doesn't accept you as a priest or priestess, it, it's not going to work. So you have to make sure that that connection to deity is there and that is something that will be accepted. Mm -hmm. And that's more of a personal thing. No one can really tell you that. It's something you have to do with your own work with deity. So if you do feel called by that deity to be their priest or priestess, the next thing you have to really look at is what exactly are you offering? So is it time? Is it doing events? Is it hosting rituals? And what does that entail? We look at all the pretty things that are associated with being a priest, and sometimes we don't look at the other things, like the logistical stuff that's involved in it. Um, in the book, I talk about how after hosting a ritual, myself and my husband stayed late, and we're scraping wax off of the rental hall floor oh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> unplugging a toilet. Oh. You know, the, 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 the sexy things you do as a priest. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a lot of hard work in it. And I think you have to make sure that you're approaching it from the idea of service, that this is your gift to the community and that you're helping build a bridge between deity and themselves. And just be prepared that there is a lot of work. There is a lot of logistics to take care of. And again, it's not about you being in the spotlight. It's about helping others find that connection to deity. And um, there's a lot of real world practical stuff that goes with it. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people skills you might need to acquire. Taking classes um, can be actually really helpful too. There's Cherry Hill Seminary and there's lots of other great online resources and books that you can look at for how to be someone who is a leader in the community and 
also kind of being honest about the things you can't do too. It's like, I am not your therapist. Yes. I will help you do a kick-ass ritual, but I'm not your therapist. So, um, you know, have resources where if someone is having a hard time, where can you direct them to? How can you help them get the care that they need? So there's a lot of things that go into being a priest because you are opening yourself up to, you know, connecting with others and the public. I think that's a really great way to put that too, because that's a lot of stuff that we don't kind of hear about or see. Um, It's the behind the scenes work that can be pretty daunting in regards to that. But that is a really great example of many of the things that could go wrong. And, oh, I bet that that was such a chore trying to get that wax out of that carpet. I've tried to get wax out of my own rugs before, and that's a pain. Oh, (laughs) Thankfully, it was hardwood floors. I was very happy about that, but it was still not fun. (laughs) No, but that's still much better than carpet because carpet gets between those fibers and it's just terrible. It's just terrible. If you're going to use candles, don't use them on carpet. Here's your lesson. (laughs) Um, But, you know, that's a really great way that we've talked about this. And I think that if we're going to, and we're seeing a lot of people that are wanting to step into that priesthood, especially now, which is really surprising um, in a lot of ways, at least it's surprising to me, but I've heard a lot of people saying, you know, I'm feeling called to be a priestess to ex deity or being a priestess to my community or and I'm saying priestess uh, as just a loose term just for the record there is no gender norms here (laughs) you can do whatever you'd like with that Uh, but it's with a lot of people that are stepping into that role um, have you seen that in your community where a lot of people are wanting to step up and kind of I guess be advocates almost for our deities I do see a lot more of that. And I think that's, that's a good thing because we kind of have, um, you know, a lot of the older folks in the pagan community, the ones who, you know, started a lot of things, they're, they're getting up there. So, you know, it's not something that they can necessarily do forever. So there has to be someone else to step up and, you know, do things when they can't. Um, And I think a lot of it, too, is COVID. I mean, we were cut off from our community so much. So, you know, you start craving it. You realize, oh, wow, not going to that open circle, you know, in two years, that really affected me. So, of course, that's going to make people want to, you know, step up and create community, too. I think that is absolutely so true because, you know, before COVID, you don't realize exactly how much you miss that human connection. And then, you know, almost three years into COVID now, even though a lot of people are still stepping out, but lots of people like myself who are chronically ill still can't go out into those big community spaces because, you know, COVID is still a thing. And so it's definitely one of those things where I am seeing a lot of people that are doing this. And it's very interesting to me. I'm excited to kind of see where the next five years go in the witchcraft and pagan communities to kind of see what crops up between all of these groups that are arising and all these people that are stepping into, I guess, almost their power and the, their space as uh, dedicants and even priestesses and priestics. So it's one of those things that I'm really excited to see kind of where that goes and how uh, the community changes. Hopefully it changes for the better. <laughs> but I, I'm very excited to see that. So uh, I know you have a couple of projects that are in the works. Do you want to talk about those? Um, Well, (laughs) we have a few things going on. We just launched a month and a half ago, something around like Mm -hmm. that, a uh, Prayers to the Morgan book, which is myself and Karen Storminger. And we have over 80 prayers to the Morgan and uh, illustrations to go with them as well. So that um, was really cool to see um, come into reality. So that was kind of an independent project for me. And that one's available on Amazon. Um, And we were actually doing an online retreat as well this year because, you know, why do an event once when you can do it twice? Exactly. So in October, we actually are going to gather online Uh, very much from what you were saying that a lot of people still can't go to live events and people are um, not able to travel and have mobility issues. And we really did learn that when we did our 
retreat online for COVID and we wanted to include those folks too. So that'll be a lot of fun to be able to see them online at least in October. Oh, that's definitely going to be super exciting. I, I love that, you know, so many um, communities out there are also realizing, hey, we're missing out on a lot of um, inclusion opportunities for people who obviously can't travel or um, right. have mobility issues. So the, the communities are doing all of these online events in addition to the in-person events are so amazing because everybody gets to be included in the party then, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm super excited about your uh, Purge of the Morgan book. I cannot wait to pick up a copy of it myself. And I am sure the illustrations are probably absolutely stunning because anything that is all renditions of artwork of the Morgan are always stunning, at least to me they are. And maybe I'm biased because, you know, I work with her, but still, <laughs> I bet they are absolutely stunning. <laughs> um, but yeah, and you do you have any other books that are coming out uh, in the next couple of years? I don't remember if you do or not. I don't think you do. Well, I have some things I'm working on, but okay. I have to you have, have to, keep to those write hush, them hush. first. Hush, hush. That's okay. That just means they're, they're in the planning. <laughs> you get to come back later and tell us all about them later. When there you go. Ready to go. <laughs> Well, this has been an absolutely wonderful experience. I absolutely love talking to you. This is always so much fun. Um, we'll have to have you back by closer to October so we can talk about that event and definitely promote it because everybody should go to it, just for the record. If you have not already picked up a copy of Stephanie's books, please do so. She has so many amazing books. We only talked about a couple of them today, but there are so many others. One of my favorites that I have had for years is The Dark Goddess Craft. I love that book. It has moved me in so many ways. And especially if you're somebody who needs to work through the darker side of your shadow, it is a great, great, great book. Please pick up a copy. I promise you, you will not regret it. Uh, pick up a copy of all of the books that we talked about today, The Priestess and the Morgan, uh, Dedicant Devotee and Priest. You will not be disappointed with these books. They are incredible reads. And The Priestess of the Morgan, I literally read in about two days. I couldn't put it down. If you are also somebody who likes your audiobooks, it is available on Audible. So go check it out. It is a great, great book. And Stephanie, thank you again for being here. <laughs> thank you again for sitting down to record with me a second time <laughs> as well. <laughs> uh, but this has just been an absolutely moving and wonderful experience. And I cannot wait to have you back on the show. Thank you. Looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, everybody, you know what to do. You guys know that you should be staying safe by now. Please take care of yourselves, especially in this crazy summer heat. Make sure you're taking really good care of yourselves. And we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye, everybody.